I don't think anybody here uh, needs me to introduce um, award-winning uh, meat maker and home brewer, Dean Stewartwald. Um, Dean uh, has been making innovations in mead uh, for quite some time now. And uh, in fact, he's where I learned what Boucher even was um, just from a Facebook post uh, that he made where I, I saw him heating honey on the stove, uh, which immediately intrigued me. And I was just wondering what the heck he was doing. Uh, and I learned there's this whole sort of world of uh, Boucher, uh, which involves that caramelization of the honey. Um, so uh, I, I know that this is something that Dean has just started his foray into. I, I, I don't think he thinks himself an expert on the subject, but rather an explorer that wants to, to share what he's learned thus far. Um, and uh, we get to um, reap the benefits of that. So I really look forward to this pr presentation uh, and I'll just uh, turn it over to you, Dean. Thanks a lot, Andy. I, I really appreciate you guys for attending and sort of uh, working with me on this. Like Andy was saying, I'm, I'm not necessarily a, a master of, of mead uh, or a master of bouchets, um, but I started making mead about five to six years ago. The, the main reason, what inspired me to get into meads is because I wanted to be successful at doing something like everyone else seemed to be in the club. You know, everyone, you know, there was a lot of award-winning brewers, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of great beers being made, but at the time there weren't a lot of people making meads, ciders. There weren't a lot of people talking about them. Uh, I didn't know of a lot of local resources to help answer some of the questions I had. And I was like, Hey, you know, this seems kind of interesting and maybe I can help fill a void. Maybe I can help give us some competition points at the state fair. Uh, after all, it is a BJCP uh, category. So I, that's why I got into it. And I found it initially to be a, a great open canvas to experiment with flavors. Um, for anybody that follows some of my other Facebook posts, I'm also an avid cook. So I like experimenting with flavors and I find mead to be a really good, uh, just uh, like I said, a nice open canvas for that more so than even beer. Um, now, how many meads have I done? I've done about 20 batches of mead over the last five years. So quite a few batches and only three of these batches have been Boucher's. Uh, if you ask a lot of the, the modern mead makers on some of the Facebook groups, only about 15% of them have ever made a Boucher. So it's a pretty intriguing and, and a mysterious topic. And, and I find it interesting, just like Andy did. When I heard about caramelizing honey, I was like, well, why would you do that? Uh, so some of the presentation points we're gonna talk about are a brief definition and a little bit of a history behind Boucher tools and ingredients for Boucher, the technical process for caramelizing honey, an experiment that involves the effect that caramelizing honey has on the appearance, aroma, and flavors, Boucher tips, honey selection, some of my projects, a little bit where my experience comes into play as far as what I would recommend you try right off the bat, and then a little bit of the basic science behind what's going on in a Boucher. So first off, a Boucher, there's really actually no modern definition of a Boucher, even in French language where it originates, there's no modern definition. There's surnames being used to this day in France, but the, 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 the modern accepted definition we have is that a Boucher is a mead made with honey that has been caramelized or burnt. Now I put burnt in quotations because whether it's semantics or not, I don't think that you should be burning your honey when you're when you're heating it up because you're going to get burnt flavors to end so i like to call it caramelization uh it falls into bjcp category m4c which is experimental mead it falls into this category because it uses an alternative process which is the act of caramelizing honey um it doesn't fall into historical mead because there isn't really a lot of historical recipes for boucher specifically and the ones that are sort of uh, they they uh, they're they sort of disagree with each other. There's no true agreement on what defined a Boucher historically, and so I think the BJCP is a little weary of of putting in historical style because they can't really point to one specific. You know, this is how you do a Boucher. Now there is some historical French literary references to the term Boucher. Uh, one includes a 1611 French English dictionary that gives a translation of Boucher as either a hydromel, which is how they referred to mead back in the day, 
or a drink from water sweetened with cinnamon and sugar. So nothing to do with honey at all in some cases, just a sweetened water beverage with cinnamon and sugar in it. There's also a 1552 French text that uses Beauchette, speaking of an inferior quality of honey from the woodlands. Now, this is going to be interesting, and it's going to be a topic that we discuss as we go along. Um, as I was discussing with Dana before we started the presentation, there are a lot of people who are interested in brewing and fermenting, but they don't want to make meads because it can be expensive. A Beauchet is a really good answer to that problem because cheap honeys work really well with Beauchets. So I thought it was interesting that even back in the 1500s, there were references to Beauchets being used with inferior quality honeys. Now, a modern French book also states that uh, a Beauchet was a 13th or 14th century drink made by boiling crushed bee skep in water and fermenting. So there are three sort of different, you know, basic interpretations. One is a reference to boiling honey, a honey product. One is more of an inferior quality of honey. And one is more of, this is just what we called meads. In medieval France, we called a mead a Beauchet that you were used interchangeably. So the history of Beauchet specific, specifically is a little ambiguous, um, but it's just interesting to see how it's developed over the years. Now, why should I care about Beauchet? Again, as we talked about, a lot of us are home brewers. There aren't a lot of people that make mead or ciders, and a lot of people either haven't had a good access to them or they're a little more expensive. They're, they're not interested in making them. So why would a bunch of brewers care about uh, Beauchets? Well, first of all, it's the one type of mead that has the most in common with beer. Uh, you're, you're manipulating the ingredients just like you are in beer. You're caramelizing honey, which is similar to roasting beer grains. Um, the flavors and aroma profiles can be similar. You can give cheap honey complex and interesting aroma flavor profiles to where it's just as characterful as a more expensive varietal honey. Uh, you can achieve different flavor profiles by caramelizing the honey less or more, just as using lighter versus darker beer grains to give your beers different flavors. And in the same sense, you would use a lower caramelized honey, just like you would use a lower, uh, lower level malt, like a pale malt. You can use them in larger quantities, whereas you typically use higher caramelize, caramelization levels just like you would use higher roasted beer grains in smaller quantities. You don't want to make a beer with 100% black patent malt. You know, it's going to be undrinkable. And you don't tend to make Beauchets with 100% of the darkest possible caramelized honey. Those are just going to be intense flavor profiles, and it's going to be pretty acidic as well. Um, now, the technical process is another thing Beauchets have in common with beer. Uh, as far as the mead world, the mead mixing day is much simpler than beer brewing day. And this added process of caramelizing honey gives Beauchet something in common with beer. It's more similar to when you would brew extract beer on your stovetop. You're just heating up malt extract and boiling it and adding some hops. The process takes about the same amount of time. And I think that fair or unfair, a lot of times mead making gets knocked for not being as hard because the actual day that you're making the mead isn't as complicated as the day that you're brewing beer. And I 100% agree. Most of the time you're making meads, you are just stirring stuff up in a fermentation vessel and you're letting it ferment. Um, keep in mind though, where it's a little simpler to start with, the process is a lot longer and it gets quite complicated after the fact. And that's where the art of, of making meads and bouchets really comes into play. And, and, and that's different than beer where you spend a lot of your time focusing on brew day, hitting target temperatures, hitting certain uh, parameters so that your beer turns out like you want it. Now, basic tools for the job of making a Beauchet, these are very specific just to Beauchets, not necessarily all meads. You're gonna want a heavy bottom stock pot. Uh, now this stock pot can be aluminum, it can be steel, it can be ceramic, whatever you wanna use. It just needs to be a heavy bottom, thicker material. And it needs to be four to five times the volume of the honey you're caramelizing. The honey will foam up. It'll foam up three to four times, in some cases, four times the, the volume that it starts off with. And you really don't want it to spill over. You don't want any risk of a safety hazard of it boiling over. Um, and you also want to promote an even transfer of heat, which is another reason you want a thicker bottom uh, pot. You don't want any hot spots or any chance for the honey to scorch. Uh, you want to use a long handle stirring utensil, preferably wood or metal, uh, something that can withstand heat, not a plastic or rubber spatula, preferably. <laughs> Uh, you ideally want to have a candy thermometer or another high temperature thermometer. It's not absolutely 
potential, as we'll see later with the experiment, the temperature ranges aren't really the most accurate indicator of where you're at, but it is good, especially when you're a beginner, to have a temperature measuring device so that you can kind of get an idea of the range that you're working with. Uh, and then lastly, you want a paper plate for, for using as a color wheel. We're going to be putting dabs of honey on this paper plate throughout the entire process from beginning to end so that we can have a visual representation of what's going on. Now, the tools for the job for any mead, I wanted to briefly cover because, again, Boche is just a mead made with caramelized honey. You don't just stop with the caramelization part. You still have to finish making the mead. So you're going to want to have a fermentation vessel, a stirring stick, airlock, racking cane, a secondary aging vessel, star sand, hydrometer, a lot of the types of things that you probably already have in your brewery. Really nothing that's specifically unique to me. You might not have a stirring stick that's a drill attachment when, you, when you're just brewing beer because there's not a lot of need for that, but it really comes in handy when you're making mead. Also a, a, a pH meter or a way, a way to measure pH would be very helpful. Um, the ingredients for, for your boche, and this again applies to any mead, is honey. Now you wanna make sure you use real honey, not some corn syrup derivative. In this case, especially with boches, Costco, Meyer, Target, Kroger, any of those store brands is more than okay. You just want a mead that is, or you just want a honey that is pure honey. You just don't want a corn syrup with food coloring added. And a lot of the, the bottles of the store, the store brand uh, honeys nowadays will say pure, pure clover or true source. Those are all, you know, uh, those are all, are all some of the representative ways to figure out if it's true honey and, and not just some, you know, mix of sugars. <laughs> The water that you want to use is spring water. Uh, it's preferred. It, you want to avoid distilled water if at all possible because it lacks nutrients. Honey as a fermentable sugar, especially in relation to beer grains, it really lacks a lot of the nutrients that you need for healthy fermentation. So every step of the way you can, you want it to use a nutritious source of an ingredient. So in this case, water, spring water is going to have a few natural uh few natural uh, nutrients that will that'll help you out. And you can use tap water and well water. Uh, Martin would be a good uh, reference for that. You just want to avoid waters that have too much chlorine in them or anything that doesn't taste very good because it's not going to taste good in the end either. As far as yeast selection, um, Boche specifically, there's nothing that's any different for selecting a Boche yeast as opposed to just any other mead yeast. You want to typically use a wine yeast. That's what's preferred due to their ability to withstand higher alcohol contents. You can use a beer yeast and you can even use a bread yeast. And honestly, if you want to go for a lower ABV mead and one that still has a little bit of residual sweetness, sometimes it's preferable to use a beer yeast. Um, some of the, the wine yeasts get up to 20, 22% alcohol tolerance. So them things will dry out just about anything and you'll be banging your head against the wall as to why you can't get some of that residual sweetness left over. Uh, yeast nutrients, you're going to want to use Go Firm for rehydrating dry yeast. And you're going to use uh, Fermato for nitrogen because, again, honey doesn't have nitrogen like beer grains do. Now, optional ingredients, but things that I use very frequently are stabilizers. Uh, this is potassium sorbate, potassium metabisulfite. These stabilizers allow you to uh, allow you to add an additional sugar, additional honey without the risk of fermentation. So if you want to make a 10% alcohol mead that's sweet, the best way to do it is to put it 10% alcohol worth of honey to start with, ferment it out to dry, stabilize it, and then back sweeten. It's going to be very difficult to get a, any wine yeast to stop at 10% alcohol and leave residual sugar. They're going to want to continue eating it. So, the, you know, in the very beginning, when I first started making these, I wanted them to have some residual sugar. And I always heard that it was best to not back sweeten because it'll taste raw if you, if you back sweeten. And all that's a myth. You know, I was sitting there making 16, 17% alcohol meads because I knew the wine yeast would consume 14% of alcohol worth of sugars and I would be left with a little bit of residual sugar. And again, this is a myth. You're, when you back sweeten a mead, it will taste a little raw to begin with, but over a couple weeks or a month, it will taste blended. So don't have no fear about back sweetening if you need to. And then obviously acids and tannins. If you don't, <coughs> it's best to use acids during bench trials near the end. Um, it's long after fermentation is complete and you could use acidic fruits as well instead of using acid blends 
tannins are the same way. You can use oak. I wouldn't really recommend using the, the liquid tannins that you can get at the brew stores. They don't, they don't give a very uh, pleasant character, in my opinion. So let's get to the heart of the presentation, that the technical process for caramelizing honey. I've got two short video clips here. They're only about 10 seconds long, just to give you an idea of, of what you're looking at. But uh, go ahead and play one of them right here. So this is as, as the honey is starting to come up to temperature. Now, I've already poured the honey into the pot and turned the heat onto medium. Okay, I don't add any water because that's just going to delay the process. You're just going to put raw honey in the stock pot, set the heat to medium on your, on your heat source. I choose to use an electric stove. It's a very controlled uh, way about going about things. So this is what it looks like about 10 to 15 minutes in. Very low simmer, okay? This is not honey boiling yet. That is just what happens about a one to two minutes before it starts to boil. Now this other video clip shows what it looks like when I would consider it to be the start of the boiling process. So that, that kind of level of, of a rolling boil is really when you wanna start your timer as far as the boiling process goes. Now, after you <coughs> go ahead and put your honey in the stock pot, you're gonna to wanna to put a dab of the honey on your color wheel. That is gonna be your raw honey. It's gonna be your point of reference. After the honey starts to come to a boil, you're gonna to wanna to put another dab of honey on your color wheel. That is gonna be your start of boil. I call that minute zero. And then every time frame that we're gonna reference beyond that point, the 15 minute mark, the 20 minute mark, it's all in relation to how long it's been boiling. Not how long it's been on the heat necessarily, but how long it's been boiling. When it does come to the boil, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you turn the heat down to low medium. That's gonna give you the best chance of not having a foam over. It's gonna give you the best chance of controlling a slow, low caramelization. There's no need to rush the process. You can do it other ways. You can turn the heat up higher if you want. I wouldn't recommend it though. At that time, you're just playing with fire. Um, you're going to want to continue to stir the honey throughout this process. You don't have to, if you're on medium low heat, you literally don't have to stand there stirring it the whole time. You just want to stir it every few minutes to make sure that nothing is scorching on the bottom, which again, it shouldn't if you're using a heavy body stock, heavy bottom stock pot. And as long as you're on low to medium heat. Now on the next slide, this is approximately 15 to 20, 25 minutes into the boil. So it's been on the heat source for about 35 minutes, it's only been boiling for about 20 minutes. And you're gonna see the texture of the foam is much different than what it started off at. It's a thicker, thicker, more like volcano, magma, slowly bubbling up. You can tell it's thicker, all right? And again, that's very different than the start of the boil where the bubbles were moving freely around. You can also see that the color is a lot darker. And when it starts to get to this point, I really do like to keep track of the temperature range to give, my, give myself an idea of where I'm at. It's very hard to see the color of the honey below the surface of the foam. And that's one of the reasons that you continue to add a dab of honey to your color wheel every five to 10 minutes, 15 minutes if you wanna wait that long. But that gives you an idea of what the true color of the honey is. And it gives you an idea of, of where you're at. Um, this, this honey, this is, this is where the art comes in. How far you take this process, how far you caramelize it, it's entirely up to you and the flavor profiles you're going for. It's really going to start off at about the 240 degree range. It's going to start off being a light caramel flavor, and it's going to progress to sort of a darker toffee or toast, and it's going to end up somewhere in the smoky range. It's cocoa, coffee, roastiness. That's sort of the, the progression of flavors and aromas you can expect over the 240 to 270 degree range. Now, I went ahead and did a little video clip of what it's like when I finally reached the point that I was happy with. 45 minutes into the boil, I reached the color, the aroma, and the flavor that I was happy with. It was nice and rich and dark and toasty. And I wanted to, I took it off the heat and I wanted to stir it around so that you can get an idea of just how dark, just how dark that that honey actually is beneath that surface. So the mocha colored foam gives you an idea that it's dark, but you can see that the honey beneath is much darker than the foam is. And again, that's why it's important to, to use the color wheel the whole time so that you have an idea of where you're at. Now, the final step of the process, and again, this is a very simple process overall. The final step that's really important, when you bring it off the heat, you need to add a little bit of water after it's cooled down for about 10 minutes. You need to add about a quart of water 
and you're going to want to add it slowly and you're going to want to stir. I would not take it immediately off the heat and add water. You're going to have a chance for a volcano, a foam over, a reaction. So don't add it right when it comes off the burner. Just wait for about 10 minutes and you're going to stir it in slowly. Now, the reason that you do this is because if you let the honey cool all the way down without adding any water, you're going to be making honey candy. This is uh, very similar to candy making. The texture of this honey is going to be is going to depend on the temperature that you raised it to. So anywhere in that 240 degree range, it's going to be like softball texture. If you go up to 260, 265, you're in that hardball texture. If you take it all the way up to 280, 290, you're in hard crack texture. So you really don't want this stuff to cool all the way down on its own. You want to change the chemical composition of it by adding a little bit of water. And here's a small clip of what that very simple process looks like. You literally just stir as you slowly add a little bit of water. No risk of foaming up at this point in time. And what you're going to get after you finish adding the quart of water is you're going to have a very homogenous, liquefied texture. And why that's important to me is you want to be able to get a good, accurate gravity reading. You're not going to get a very good, accurate gravity reading if your mixture is too thick or if you let it turn into a, a rock candy ball. If you've got little pieces of rock candy floating around in a liquid, eventually, yes, it will dissolve, but it's going to be very difficult to get an accurate gravity or pH reading on, on your mead mixing day if, if you don't at least get into a homogeneous liquefied texture. So this is just to sort of give you an idea of the pictures of the stages that we went through. Um, starting off with the top left corner, this was when the honey was completely unheated. This was a raw local wildflower honey. So you can tell it's a little bit opaque. And the reason is the, uh, the sugars have crystallized in it. Now, most of your grocery store or cheaper honey will not crystallize because it's been heated and a lot of times filtered. Okay. And that's a lot of the times why it's not as characterful as some of the more unique varietal honeys. So this honey starts off opaque in the top left corner. After about five minutes on the heat, it starts to bubble a little bit and liquefy. And the top right corner, after about 10 minutes on the heat, it's completely liquefied. In the bottom left corner, a white foam will start to appear. This is the signal that you're just about to simmer. In the, in the bottom middle picture, this is about 15 to 20 minutes on the heat source. It starts to come to a rolling boil. All right. And in the bottom right picture shows what it looks like near the end of the process when it's got a dark, nice dark color and you're sort of you're near the end of your process. So that's just to give you a sort of a visual representation of the stages it goes through um, as you progress. Now, finishing this mead making. Pro well, first of all, was there any questions on that that technical process of caramelizing the honey? Not really, right? So, uh, there's, there's... all right, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, why why not just heat it to um, why why heat it above two forty? Um, why not just heat it to two forty and and you're then you're in like sugar syrup territory? Is it because you because it won't darken enough at that temperature? That's a good question, Andy. So you, what I'm going to actually talk about here in a few minutes is the experiment that I did where time actually had more of an impact than temperature did. So I like that you bring that up. Why I reference 240 is because that's usually the point you start to actually realize some of those caramel flavors. Before the internal temperature of the honey is at that 240 degree mark, you really haven't started to, to appreciate those flavors. Um, it just hasn't started the caramelization process yet. Now, the, the other why, thing being, is it, is it also hard? I mean, it's sort of hard to keep it at a temperature, right? You got to really crank it down because it's really, the temperature is reflective of how much water's in there. And yeah. If you, if you boil off water, the temperature has to go up basically if you're still adding heat. Right. So, so the reason that it climbs from 240 to 270, I'm not increasing the temperature of the heat source. It's staying on medium low. That the water, like Tom said, is evaporating. The most honeys are about 16 to 18% water content. So as that water evaporates, obviously the sugar caramelizes darker. Everything gets a little bit hotter. It's a natural process. Now there have been people that have held their honey a little bit lower 
trying to keep it in that 240 to 250 range, which like Tom says, it basically requires you to keep moving it on and off the heat source or turn the heat all the way, all the way down to simmer for you to do that. It will continue to darken even if it stays at a constant temperature because it's exposed to more, a longer time period, basically. And, and that's an interesting thing that I found out in the experiment that I did, which I really didn't, I didn't ever think about because a lot of the recipes and a lot of the literature on Bochet's don't reference time. They reference temperatures as if that, because it's so similar to candy making in which temperatures are referenced. This is your softball stage. This is your hardball stage. These are the flavors. You know, when you're making toffee, you do this. If you're making a lighter caramel, you do, you do that. And I think that because the process is so similar, there's just not a lot of reference to time spent. But I, I like that you brought that up, Andy, because that, that is exactly one of the surprising things that I found in my experiment is, is the effect that time actually had. Yeah, and Dean, the, the other thing I'd say is uh, just, you know, as a comment is for anybody who's made um, like brewing sugars, um, as several of us have, this seems like very similar. Uh, there's a lot of transferable knowledge and experience that uh, I'm excited to do this. And, and I'm thinking like that brewing sugar, brewing syrups, you know, your amber threes and your whatever all the numbers andrew knows them but anyway same it seems like there's a lot of same processes going on uh the question though i have is you keep mentioning coloring wheel that's your paper plate i don't think you showed a picture of it yet yes but like just taking a putting a dab on the paper plate and to be able to monitor the darkening is that what you're talking about there yeah yeah and again the the, the biggest reason is that you, that you get a visual representation of where you're at because it's hard to see below the surface of the foam, you know, what, what's the actual color? I mean, you, you're going to be using all your senses when you do this. And that's something we're going to talk about in the experiment. And something we're going to talk about from my experience is the fact that your senses are probably your best tool when you're making a boche. And we're going to see from the experiment that some of these temperature ranges can be not that accurate in terms of what to expect. And a lot of it has to do with the color that it's at and what you're smelling. Um, I like that you brought up the, uh, the correlation to Belgian candy uh, syrups and candy sugars. I actually talk about that later, too, as far as some of the science behind what's going on, the difference between caramelization versus Mallard reaction and uh, some of the, those things. Because a lot of what you're doing with Belgian candy sugars or kilning malts is actually a, a Mallard reaction. And it's, it's something that happens uh, in the presence of, you know, it's a reaction between amino acids and reducing sugars. And it really happens in the, in the presence of some sort of a protein you know, or, or amino acids. And it's not something that happens as commonly, you know, when you're, when you're caramelizing the honey, you also don't get to the internal temperatures that uh, a true like Mallard reaction requires, which is about 285 degrees on that surface. You know, if you're, if you're searing a steak, your internal temperature of your steak isn't going to be 285, but that surface temperature needs to get up to that and above before you really start to see those reactions. So. Which, which temperature the, makes me think uh, just one other thing is, uh, um, I think you had a candy thermometer in there, which is probably a good idea. It was, I think I tried to make candy sugar once with like my trusty thermal pen and the thermal pen doesn't read that high or uh, yeah, yeah. I remember something like that. So old school candy thermometer is pretty, pretty useful here, I would guess. Yeah. And that, it is funny because the picture I have is, is my thermal pen on the table, but I talk about candy thermometer because it's something you can just leave in there and not worry about. It's like, I don't want to damage my hundred dollar thermometer or in fact, it doesn't read those higher temperatures. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of good questions there. And uh, I, I, some of it we'll actually specifically cover. Hey, just, <clears throat> just a quick comment, Dean. <clears throat> this, this whole process is actual caramelization. Yes. And I think you're going to talk about this in a, in a little bit, but just to, to clarify, those of us that studied BJCP and used to teach about it a long time ago, we always used to talk about kettle caramelization in, in making scotch ales and stuff like that. And that's why the, the guidelines have been changed and why we try to avoid that term caramelization these days, because that's not caramelization. What you're talking about here in the absence of water where the temperature can can get way up there, that's actual caramelization. But anything you're doing in a brew kettle is not caramelization. It's more the Maillard reactions. Yes. Right. So basically to, to finish off the, the process, I, I did want to just cover a little bit of 
how you finish the boche because again, it is, you are making a mead. So it's important to realize some of the main differences, you know, in fermentation. Your first few days of fermentation, after you've mixed everything together, you're going to need some TLC, all right, some tender love and care. You're going to need to follow some sort of nutrient addition protocol. Uh, the reason is, is again, honey doesn't have ni enough nitrogen in it for there to be a healthy fermentation. Beer grains do. Honey doesn't. So you, you need to add a form of nitrogen. Now, the most common form of nitrogen comes in the form of either Fermade K and DAP or the more modern use is Fermade O, which is an organic source of nitrogen. And it's actually uh, made from dead yeast holes. Um, and if you ever smell a bag of it, I, I sort of discussed this briefly with Ron about know, seven or eight months ago. We were talking about yeast autolysis and how to actually pick it up. What does it smell like? And I told him to smell some Fermade O because I can't say that it's the exact same, but it's what dead yeast smells like, and it's not very pleasant at all. Um, but it's a great source of organic nitrogen. So that's why we tend to use it uh, in, in the mead world. Now, the protocol that we usually use is called Tazna 3.0. It's Tailored Organic Staggered Nutrient Edition. Now, there's an online calculator where you basically type in the gravity of your initial mead must, and you type in the volume, and it'll tell you. You know, based on your yeast you're using, this is how much, this is how many grams of nutrient you need. And it also talks about how many grams of uh, GoFirm, which is your rehydrating nutrient that you use for your dry yeast. Uh, it's a very simple process, but again, this is, this is just a slight difference from a beer fermentation. You know, your first day after you've pitched your yeast, you're going to need to add some nutrients. Your second day, you need to add some nutrients. Your third day, you need to add some nutrients. And the very last set of nutrients you would add, your fourth dose, would be at the one third sugar break. However, I will say, if you've got a pretty healthy and active fermentation, by the time your fourth day rolls around, a lot of the times you're past the one third sugar break. And if you're past the one third sugar break, do not add any more nutrients. That's where it can be detrimental because at that point in time, your yeast isn't really consume or needing to consume that nutrient at that part of the bell curve in the fermentation process. And when you put that fermato, that, that raw fermato in there and it doesn't get consumed or absorbed, it's just going to basically flavor your mead like a spice addition would. And that is not a spice addition you want in your mead. I can tell you that. So a lot of times I'd say 70 to 80% of the time, you know, if you properly rehydrate your yeast and you're fermenting at the proper temperature for your wine yeast, which is typically 60 to 72 degrees, then your, your fermentation probably isn't going to need that last dose of, of nutrient addition. But again, you can check with a hydrometer, see what your gravity is. If you still haven't reached your one-third sugar break, then go ahead and add your uh, last addition. And another important thing when you're adding your nutrient additions, make sure you degas your mead. That's where that stirring stick with a drill attachment comes in handy, or at least some sort of stirring utensil. You want to make sure you degas it so that it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't erupt when you add uh when you add your nutrient and stir it in. Uh, at the same time, if, if you have a, a fruit cap in your mead because you're using fruit in your primary fermentation, you definitely wanna agitate the fruit cap to let that CO2 escape. Obviously CO2 is not the friend of a healthy fermentation. So you just don't want a lot of that to get trapped in there. Uh, you, you just wanna release it as much as you can along the way. Otherwise you're gonna, when you, when you go to degas at the end, you're just gonna be sitting there for 45 minutes, slowly stirring it, it's gonna erupt and then you have to let it calm down, stir it again. It's going to erupt again. You have to let it calm down. It's better just to do this as a best practice as, as your first few days of fermentation uh, are, are realized. And this little short clip here is what a mead must. This is actually the boche. This is from the honey I'm using in my experiment. Okay. And this is a boche one day after I pitched the yeast. This gives you an idea of how active a, a mead fermentation is. Um, you can see a little bit below the surface there, some yeast. And then you're gonna get a bubble, about one or two bubbles every four or five seconds. So it's gonna be like this for the first couple of days. It's gonna seem like it's sluggish. Like if you're coming from the beer world and you're used to beer fermentations and how active they can be and how quick they can be, the mead world is a little different. It's a slower process. It's gonna take a couple, two to three weeks a lot of times for the entire process um, to, to occur. And obviously that depends on, you know, your starting gravity, just like it would in the beer world. 
But I just don't want anybody to to get discouraged if a couple of days in you, your meat is only bubbling once or twice every five or six seconds. That's completely normal and it's okay. You really want to just see some activity within 24 to 36 hours of pitching your yeast. If you don't see activity within 24 to 36 hours, there's a good chance that you're, you didn't use enough yeast or it wasn't properly rehydrated or you're not fermenting in the right temperature or the yeast was just not healthy. So at that point in time, it's, you probably should pitch some fresh yeast. Now, this is the, the fun part. Is there any questions on those final sort of steps of finishing off the, the mead process or? All right. So the fun part is the experiment time. Now, I wanted to measure the effect that temperature had on the appearance, the aroma, and the flavor of different honeys. So I decided to compare three different honeys ranging in price from cheaper honey that was $35 a gallon to more expensive varietal honey that was $60 a gallon. The three honeys I chose to use were a Kroger brand pure clover, a local raw wildflower honey, and a Florida orange blossom honey. And the idea was to observe each honey at room temperature at 240, 250, and 260 degrees. And again, I chose those temperature ranges because those are the, the ranges that you typically start to get some of your caramel and toasty or dark and roasty flavors. So I just wanted to see how did those honeys hold up at those temperatures? Were you able to get you know, some of the varietal characteristics to come through. Uh, the inspiration from this was really a lot of mead makers saying, saying that it's pointless to use expensive varietal honeys when making a boche because, you know, the volatile aromas and flavors get burned off. Obviously, this makes intuitive sense. As brewers, we can all appreciate hop schedules. The fact that later hop additions are going to retain more of the flavor and the aromatics, while the earlier ones tend to lose a lot of the unique uh, characteristics that, that makes those specific hops different. So intuitively, it makes sense. Why would you spend all this money on a nuanced bridal honey and then boil the hell out of it, caramelize it? Um, you know, it, I, a, a local beekeeper a couple of years ago, I was telling her about uh, a boche I was going to do, and she was asking if I needed any honey for it. I told her, what's the point? You know, I'm caramelizing it. It's going to burn off the, uh, the unique aromatics. And, and her point was actually pretty valid. And it's something that I practice in the cooking world. And she was like, look, if you start off with the raw ingredient that's a little more characterful and a, a, a little more unique to begin with, chances are, even if you apply heat to the process, you're not going to completely void it of any, you know, unique characteristic at the end. You're going to still end up with a different product than if you were to use a cheaper or less characterful honey. So I remember her saying that, but I was never really motivated to play around with that expensive project because I really didn't think that there was much to it. So I thought that this would be a good time to maybe go ahead and test a little bit of that out. So the, the first honey that I did uh, was a local raw wildflower honey. Uh, I had five pounds of it. And the reason I mentioned how much, how much honey I had is because when using five pounds of this honey, it was a lot more it was a lot more volume and weight than the other two honeys I had. I only had about a pound and a quarter of the other two honeys. And something that we've talked about earlier about how important the temperature was or the time spent, it comes into play here. Obviously, if you have five pounds of honey versus only one and a quarter pounds, you're going to heat that honey up quicker. So all those, all those temperatures we're talking about, they were getting reached in a quicker period of time. So when we were talking about 240 degrees mattering or 250 degrees being an important temperature or 260 degrees, I was always thinking about it because that's what we hear about in recipes that, that modern mead makers use. We hear about that temperature range. No one really talks about the time. And I think part of it is because to make a boche of a substantial volume, you're going to need three or four pounds of honey. And when you caramelize that volume of honey, the, the flavors tend to correspond with those temperature ranges, the flavors of caramel start at about 240 when you're using a large enough volume. But as we're going to see with the next two, that's not necessarily the case. The temperature wasn't as indicative as time was. So basically, in the first in the first honey that I had, five pounds of raw local wildflower at room temperature, the appearance was opaque and straw colored. You can see that on the honey wheel right here. The very first splotch was raw honey from local wildflower, okay? Now, 240 degrees, the appearance was light caramel. As you'll see on the honey wheel, that's the 15 minute mark, 240 degrees, you sort of get a light caramel color. 
at 250 degrees, you're at medium amber. So 250 degrees is the 25 minute mark and there's more of a medium amber color. 260 degrees, you're at a dark amber with reddish highlights. And that is the 45 minute mark when you're using five pounds of honey on a medium low heat in a heavy duty stock pot, that's about how long it took to get to that point. All right. Now, some of the aromas and the flavors associated with these different temperatures at room temperature, the aroma of, of the local raw wildflower was moderate floral, clover, fresh cut hay. At 240 degrees, I was starting to get some rich caramel, some lightly toasted bread, actually a Munich malt character, which I thought was interesting. Faint dried hay, so it was no longer fresh cut hay, it was more of a dried hay characteristic. At 250 degrees, I was getting rich toffee, dark toast, no more floral or hay aromatics. So at 250 degrees on this one, I wasn't really getting any of the, the varietal characteristics that I was when it was raw, okay? Not to say that the flavor might have been different than others, but it, it, I wasn't getting of those unique characteristics. And at 260 degrees, I'm starting to get some aromas that are moderately smoky, burnt caramel, rich maltiness. The flavor pretty much follows suit. At room temperature, it was moderately high, clover, alfalfa, very distinguishable, not just a general floral character, not just a general grassiness, but actual characteristics of the floral sources that the bees obviously used uh, for this honey. It was very sweet, had a sort of a light spice uh, character, which is actually pretty typical of true clover honeys. A lot of them have a light spice characteristic to them. So there's a good chance that this wildflower honey was predominantly clover uh, based, although that's just speculation. Uh, at 240 degrees, the flavors were lightly toasty. Now it's weird because I actually got an intense fresh cut hay flavor. So in some ways, probably because some of the water had boiled off, but this is before a lot of the darker caramelization flavors had, had come into play. It seemed like some of the flavors were just concentrated versions of what they started off with as being raw. And again, I think that, uh, I believe Tom brought up the point that, you know, as that water boils off, obviously the flavors are concentrating as well. So I did notice that although some light toasty flavors were starting to come in at that 240 degree stage, there were some you know, varietal characteristics. Now at 250 degrees, we're starting to get darker toffee, darker toast, moderate savory characteristics. It's not as sweet anymore. It's a light umami character, almost reminiscent, not of soy sauce, but of an umami characteristic that sort of reminds you of soy sauce or a savory note. And I thought that was pretty interesting that obviously it was probably a higher starting gravity than what it was to begin with because you're boiling off some of the water and some of the moisture and you're concentrating the sugars but at the same time, it didn't taste as sweet because some of those darker notes are starting to cover up some of those sweeter notes that you're, you're accustomed to with fruity and floral honeys. At 260 degrees, which is where I stopped it, you're into the light smoke, burnt toffee, roasted malts, coffee, dark cocoa, very savory, very savory flavors. And I, I actually like those flavors, and that's where I chose to stop it. So all of this made sense to me. This, this sort of mimicked my experience with caramelizing honey in the past. And I think a lot of it had to do with the volume being similar. You know, I, I usually caramelize about five or six pounds up to 12 pounds at a time. And with that amount of volume, it just so happens to be that those temperature ranges kind of line up with the types of flavors you can expect. Now, it's a little different when we get to the Kroger, Kroger brand clover honey. And, and part of it is because of the low volume. So it was one and a quarter pounds, all right? Now the appearance of this honey was very pale straw. So as you can see on this color wheel, very, very lightly colored honey. At 240 degrees, it was just straw, okay? So you can see that this honey, because it was such a small amount of volume, reached 240 degrees in five minutes. And it's, it's really not caramely at all. It didn't have any caramel notes really at 240 degrees not many caramel flavors or aromas at all, uh, even though it was at 240. And I thought that was interesting because again, you know, kind of going back to Andy's point, what's so special about the temperature? Mo most of the recipes talk about temperature ranges, you know, and this is when you can start to expect some of those flavors to come into play. And I just thought it was interesting how I didn't really start to get those flavors until it hit the 15 minute mark when it was at about 250 degrees. And the funny thing about that is, the bigger batch of honey 
took 15 minutes to get to 240 degrees. And that's when I started to realize some of those flavor notes. This honey took 15 minutes to get 250 degrees. So it seems like time spent boiling was a better indicator as well as color, better indicator of the flavors and aromas you can expect than the temperature necessarily was. So they go hand in hand a little bit, but you know, the time spent and obviously looking at it is a lot better indicator. So obviously the, the honey darkened over the time period. It went from pale straw to straw to light amber to a reddish amber. It never got as dark as the other, the, the first honey did. It would have gotten darker if I would have left it on it longer, but I was already at 260 degrees and I was kind of trying to compare across the temperature range. I wasn't, I didn't set out to compare across the same time range. So I, I wanted to kind of keep the temperatures isolated so we could see what the difference was. Now the aromas, they sort of went from lightly floral, moderate fruitiness into a medium fruitiness with light clover notes. And then they transferred into light toast, moderate caramel, and they finished off with like a medium amount of toast. So they didn't get, again, the flavors and aromas didn't get as dark and rich and robust as the first honey because it didn't spend as much time boiling. Even though it was at that same temperature, it just didn't spend enough time to develop some of those flavors. And I, I thought it was interesting because this honey did retain some of those characteristics of fruitiness, of a light floral characteristic up until about 240 or 250, but they were just sort of indistinguishable. They weren't a specific fruit or a specific floral source. They were just generically still a little fruity, generically a little floral. And honestly, if you were to ferment it out, and make a meat out of it, it's hard to say whether or not any of those characteristics would transfer in the end. Um, the very last one, pretty similar to, pretty similar to the Kroger pure clover honey in the fact that it was one and a quarter pounds. So I'm gonna tell you right now, the Florida orange blossom honey blew the other two honeys away. It was the most distinct, unique, characterful to begin with. It definitely had a moderate fruitiness, a citrus blossom aroma, uh, the flavor was a high fruity, medium citrus blossom, uh, very sweet, and it had a definitive acidic kick. Now you can see the, uh, the picture on the color wheel of the Florida orange blossom. It actually started off as the darkest colored honey, but it tended to follow the similar color wheel as the Kroger brand honey. So even though it started off darker, it ended up as roughly the same color after about the same time period. You know, after about the 30 minute mark, this was the pure clover. All right. And after the 30 minute mark, this was the Florida, Florida orange blossom. It's slightly darker and makes sense. It started off slightly darker, but it never got as dark as the bigger batch did because again, it didn't spend that amount of time at those temperatures. Um, what I did notice and what I liked the best about the Florida orange blossom honey is that into the 240 and 250 degree range, it lost a little bit of the defining citrus notes, but it retained an intense, jammy, stewed fruit kind of character. So I did appreciate that. And I could see in the future potentially using a lightly caramelized orange blossom honey. So before those darker, heavier, smoky or dark toast notes set in, when you're more in that light toffee or light caramel range, you're still going to be able to pick up a pretty distinguishing fruity characteristic, albeit maybe not citrusy, but definitively fruity and a very pleasant fruitiness that was much more pleasant than the generic fruitiness that I got from the Kroger hunt. So these are all three of the color wheels sort of side by side. The top left is the Florida orange blossom. The top right is the local wildflower and the bottom is the Kroger brand, brand pure clover. Now to me, just visually looking at this, the top left and the bottom seem to be more similar as far as how dark they got. And again, those were the two that I had only one and a quarter pounds of. And those were the two that spent less time. It took less time to get to temperatures. It took less, it spent less time overall boiling. You know, I, I, I didn't know how much further I wanted to take. I actually took them both to 265 degrees. I only took the local wildflower to 260 degrees, but it took 45 minutes, 45 minutes boiling to get the five pounds of local wildflower to that final 260 degree stage. So I, I, it's quite obvious that, that time had a bigger impact than uh, the actual temperature in this, in this case. So some of the takeaways I had from the experiment was that the varietal characteristics did remain in the aroma and flavor up to a point. Uh, the more distinct varietal orange blossom honey definitely continued to showcase unique flavors 
for a longer period of time than the others. And again, that makes intuitive sense. If it starts off a little more unique, it's going to finish with a little more unique characteristics. Um, now, these flavors and aromas remained until about 250, 255 degrees, but they were less and less distinct as time and temp increased. So in the case of the orange blossom, like I already said, it started off with a distinct citrus note and it sort of became generically fruity and jammy. With all that said, the time spent on the heat source definitely mattered just as much, if not more, than the temperature. Time isn't really discussed that much as the temperature ranges are in modern literature and modern recipes for Boucher. The smaller batches of honey came up to temp much quicker, but again, they didn't get as dark until they had spent time at those temperatures. And the corresponding colors, aromas, and flavors lined up better with the smaller batches when you compare them to the time period that the bigger batch spent. Not the temperatures, it's the time period. Now, from that experiment, from my opinion, Boche honey selection, I would still recommend using cheaper honey for most Boche projects. The reason I say this is that fundamentally, the point of the, the appeal of Boche are the distinct aromas and flavors of toast, roast, toffee, caramel, smoke, dark cocoa. By the time you're realizing these aromas and flavors in any appreciable amount, most of the remaining varietal characteristics are just not very distinguishable. So even if they've sort of held on to a generic fruitiness or a generic floral quality, they're just not, they're not distinguishable enough to justify the spending twice the amount of money. Now, if you want to, you can, and your product will taste different. It's just not going to be that distinguishable. And, and in my opinion, it's not really worth it as much. Now, if you decide to use a higher quality honey, I would recommend using, I recommend caramelizing it on the lower end of the spectrum. So I would recommend taking it maybe 20 to 25 minutes into the boil, somewhere around that 240, 245 temperature range. Again, you're going to want to use your senses here because the temperature isn't super accurate. Your color, your smell, your taste are going to be much better indicators of where you're at in the process. So I, I just, I, I, I would, I would encourage you maybe to use the expensive varietal during back sweetening at the end. You know, even if you wanted to boche a small amount of it lightly, use it at the end to back sweeten your project. You know, that way you're going to have the best chance of those characteristics standing out. Because if you put it into primary, it's going to be exposed to a fermentation. You know, and when that fermentation happens, just like with fresh hop beers, they are going to uh, get pushed out by CO2 being expelled. So I would recommend using it at the end and I would recommend caramelizing just very lightly. Is there any questions on the experiment or, or what, what I sort of discovered or found out during the process? All right, cool. Um, basic tips that I can give you for making a boche just to sort of sum up that aspect of it. You want to make sure you use a heavy bottom pot that is four to five times the volume of the honey that you're caramelizing. Don't rush, go low and slow, preferably on medium heat to start and take it down to a medium low once the honey starts to boil. Use all your senses, sight, smell, and taste are crucial and they're your best friend. Don't forget to mix in some water after removing from the heat and you let it cool briefly. All of those steps, if you follow those, you're going to have a successful caramelization. You're not, it's not going to boil over if you follow those steps. You're not going to burn your honey if you follow those steps. If you just pay attention and do your color wheel and sort of taste and smell as you go, um, you're going to have success with making a boche. Now, finding balance in boche. Th this is probably the most difficult aspect of mead making in general. Um, I discussed earlier how sometimes the mead making process is frowned upon by brewers. Is it's a simple process, you know. Mead making is not as hard. You know, the, the actual mead mixing day is very simple. You're just stirring in the ingredients, and a lot of that's true. But you know where it becomes hard is when you try to balance acidity and sweetness, or you're trying to balance tannin and sweetness. When you realize that your fermentable sugar source, being honey, lacks a lot of it lacks structure. It lacks tannin. It has acidity, but if you finish the mead sweet, it might not have enough acidity. In the wine world, all right, if you're using grapes as your fermentable source, obviously there's tannin already and you know, there's acidity in that fruit. So you can, you, you start off in a little bit better footing. And this is why a lot of meads come across flabby or one dimensional, that they lack body and structure. 
because the mead maker probably doesn't have as much experience balancing it out at the end or, or some point in time uh, during fermentation with, it, with acids and tannins. Now, I'll tell you that it's not a great idea to just not think about balance at all from the beginning. If you want, to, if you want a good chance to have a balanced product in the end, start thinking about it from the beginning with your recipe formulation. So ideas of flavor combos that work well in food or other beverages, that's a good place to start. Things that taste good are going to taste good a lot of the times in mead. A lot of the reason that some of the food dishes you make taste good is because they're balanced. You know, the balance between sweet and savory or spicy and salty and sour. That applies to mead making. So a lot of the beverages and foods that you may enjoy, especially the dessert ones, are going to, to encourage you naturally to find a balance. If you're going to make a key lime pie mead or a key lime pie boche, it's going to have some lime character in it. It's going to have some acidity. So that's going to encourage a balance from the beginning. And that's why I say, think about it from the very beginning in terms of what flavors you want to achieve. Don't just wait till the end and go, oh crap, now I got to run to great fermentations and find some liquid tannin and liquid acid and try to balance this thing out. You know, you're going to have a very sharp, rough around the edges mead if you try to save it all at the end. Um, acids and tannins obviously provide valuable structure so your mead isn't flabby. Um, if you're not going to use tannic or acidic fruits, you can adjust later on. You can adjust later on with lemon juice if you want to. You can adjust later on with tartaric acid or some of the other acid blends. Um, you can adjust along the way with oak to get some tannin if you're not going to use tannic fruits. Um, I actually use oak in almost every single meat I make in primary fermentation just for some of that structure. And if you use about a half ounce of oak per gallon, in your primary fermentation, you're not usually going to end up with an oaky character in the mead as far as the flavor or the aroma. So if you don't want the oaky character, but you want some of the structure that those tannins can provide, then use it in primary. If you want some flavoring additions of oak, use it in secondary or after, after your primary is done and if you're aging it, then you can get some more of those flavors and aromas of oak. Um, the other big thing that happens with meads is how sweet is too sweet. Obviously, most commercial meaderies tend to focus on sweeter meads because it's what sells. Most of the general public that goes to try a mead expects it to be sweet to some extent because they associate honey with being sweet. So it's odd to them to try a dry mead. And it's really odd to try a dry mead when honey lacks a lot of the structure that wine lacks. So a dry wine is going to come across as a more complete beverage and a flavorful beverage as as opposed to a, a dry mead in a lot of cases. So a little bit of sweetness, even just sweetening up to 1005 or 1010 can, can bring out some of those qualities that you want. Now, how sweet is too sweet? It depends on what you're going for. Obviously, the flavor profile of the food or beverage that you're trying to emulate will dictate how sweet is too sweet. So a lot of the times, if you want to make, uh, if you want to make a, I don't know, a mead that tastes like chocolate pudding, well, is chocolate pudding acidic? No. So don't worry that much about trying to put some acid in your chocolate pudding mead. What I would say to you is that a chocolate pudding mead probably isn't going to be the most drinkable, drinkable thing. If you're going to make a chocolate pudding mead, it's probably going to need to be sweeter. And again, you're not going to have acid in it because you don't want it to taste sweet and tart because chocolate pudding doesn't taste sweet and tart. So just keep it in mind that if, you're, if your goal is to make a sweet dessert mead that doesn't usually have any acids in it as far as a flavor profile, then just know that it's probably going to be just a sipper, an after-dinner drink. Uh, maybe you can try to make a session mead out of it. That way it's not so heavy. It doesn't sit on your palate as much because you're going to have some of those sweeter flavors. Maybe you can make it carbonated in, in a lower alcohol content. That way it comes across at least a little more drinkable. But, you know, the sweetness is up to you. It, it's how sweet it is depends on what flavors you have going into it, depends on how acidic your honey was. And a lot of that just comes from experience and tasting. And the hardest thing that I, you know, realized when I was starting to make mead was that when you don't have experience drinking a lot of it, it's hard to tell how good of a job you're doing or not doing. It's hard to tell how much acid do you really need to balance out a mead until other people can try them or until you've tried a lot of commercial meads, you really don't have a good frame of reference. And I understand it's, not something that a lot of people do because a lot of good meat isn't as accessible. It's not as cheap. Um, it's becoming more accessible. You're starting to see more meads on your, on beer shelves and you're starting to see cheaper meads. Uh, New Day Meadery was 
pretty famous for making a lot of session meads over the years that are pretty approachable. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting as far as, you know, meaderies doing sweeter meads or how sweet is too sweet. And remember, one key thing with Boche specifically is that your deeper caramelized honey is, is going to have savory notes. And those savory notes are going to be a natural counterbalance to sweetness. Some of those darker toasty notes do a good job themselves of balancing out sweetness. It doesn't always have to be acid and tannin based. It can just be a balance of flavors. Now your lighter caramelized honey tends to give the impression of sweetness. So when you're, when you're, you're doing a lighter colored boche and you're on the caramel spectrum, it gives the impression of sweetness in the same way that maltiness can in beer. So I've usually found that a, a lighter colored boche at 10, 10 gravity will actually seem sweeter than a darker boche at the same gravity. And it's like, it gives it that impression of sweetness, even when it's not. I know Ron has done a, a lot of education over the years of really trying to separate the difference between maltiness and sweetness. And it's kind of interesting because some of this applied where it's like, okay, I, I can tell that my, my 10, 10 gravity mead might not be sweet, but it can give the impression of sweetness when it's got those caramel flavors uh, involved. Some of the Boche projects I've worked on have stemmed from a lot of those beliefs. Uh, the first Boche I ever did was a bananas French toast Boche. Um, I was attempting to bring out the dark toast notes in toast, and I was trying to use caramelized honey to do that. Um, this was a massive failure, and it wasn't because of the boche aspect. This mead was like the fourth mead I had ever made, and I tried to do too many things at once, and it just got all convoluted. You know, I was using bananas, I was using maple syrup, I was using cinnamon, vanilla, caramelized honey, uh, oak. I, I just used too much. I, I was using bananas. I didn't know how to best use the bananas. I didn't know if I should wait until they're overly ripe and just throw them in. I didn't know if I should try to cook them down in a crock pot to try to give the impression of that stewed caramelized banana character but this meat just didn't work out and it, it just ended up tasting like too much going on at once so what i learned from that one was take it step by step a lot of the research i did after that mead people have done meads similar to that but sometimes they'll do them in, in as separate meads they'll make maybe a banana mead and then they'll make a boche maybe they'll make a spiced mead that just has cinnamon and vanilla in it and then they can combine them and that's what a lot of the award-winning mead makers, you know, some of the best guys in the industry and, and gals in the industry now, they actually just blend pre-made meads. So that way it's not all just one, one uh, attempt like I had failed. Now, the, the second uh, boche I made is one that a couple of the club members have tried. It was a caramel apple sizer boche. This is probably, probably the best mead I've ever made. And I think it was because it did a good job of balancing the bright green apple acidity with some of those caramel and toffee notes. It really gave the impression of, you know, a, a caramel apple, you know, that you would get at a fair or even a, a, a caramel apple pie, sort of like the, the filling of a caramel apple pie or a bourbon caramel apple pie. Um, I, I used quite a few different things uh, in this meat as well. I just did a better job of it. I, I used a tincture that was rye whiskey, about four ounces of rye whiskey soaking with oak cubes and cinnamon sticks and vanilla. Again, I was trying to get that baking spice kind of character. I wanted to use the whiskey because I thought that the, the rye whiskey notes would be complementary to not only the spice notes, but also the darker, uh, darker toffee and caramel notes in the boche. I thought it all worked well together. And as you can see from the, the picture of the meat in the glass, the color is a deep, rich amber. And it's, it's a beautiful mead to look at and, and one to taste. And the final uh, Boche project that I've worked on is the one that I'm currently fermenting from the, the honeys that I was experimenting with during this presentation. Now, Ron brought it up earlier, caramelization, you know, Mallory reaction, some of the basic science. We briefly talked about it, but caramelization is the browning of sugar caused by three polymers. Caramelins, caramelins, and caramelins. <laughs> one's an A, one's an E, and one's an I. I don't know how to pronounce them all differently. But as this process occurs, volatile chemicals such as the acyl are released, and that's what produces the defining caramel flavor. All right, now a Maillard reaction has more to do with the chemical reaction between amino acids and reducing sugars, which gives brown foods their flavor. This reaction, you're going to see it when you're kilning malts, again, in the lack of moisture and the lack of water. When you're making Belgian candy sugar, when you're searing steaks, uh, it's, it needs to occur usually in the presence of protein. Now, one interesting thing is that 
I did find a recipe was where someone was trying to attempt to do a Malheur reaction Boche, and they actually added a, a lye solution at about 240 or 250 degrees and then let the temperature rise to see if they could get some of those Malheur notes. Now, I associate Malheur, Malheur reaction flavors with obviously melanoidins. So I got some toasty flavors that, that I would typically associate with those. I didn't get like dark fruit necessarily. But I got some toastier flavors and some darker toasty flavors just by going to a rich caramelization level. Um, so I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now, also, you're, you're dealing with flavor concentration due to evaporation. Uh, as Tom brought up, you know, the honeys obviously have a water content in them. They're about 16 to 18%. When the honey boils, the water is evaporating. So you're concentrating the, the sugars and you're lowering the pH. And one thing that you got to pay attention to with Boches is that the pH tends to be lower to start off with. So you need to be mindful of that in terms of how much honey you are caramelizing of your total honey bill. You know, if you've, if you've got 12 pounds going in, you can go all caramelized if you want, but maybe stick on the lighter or medium caramelization level, not only for the concentration of flavors, but because the pH will be lower the further you take the caramelization. And this is similar to malts. You know, the darker malts have a lower acidity. Some alternative methods of caramelization, you can use a crock pot, you can go low and slow. I've never done it, but for anybody who's intimidated by using a boil kettle or a stovetop, you can essentially, from what I hear, you can put honey in a slow cooker um, and set it to low for about seven to eight hours and it'll caramelize. And it's, like I said, it's, you don't have to babysit it, but it takes a longer period of time. The stovetop method that I've used, it's a nice regulated way to do it. I, I think it's the best use of time. It only takes about an hour. It's not that dangerous. If you follow the steps I outlined, if you keep it on medium, medium, low temperature, and you have your stock pot that's four to five times the volume of your honey, you're not going to have any problems. The kettle method, sort of the medieval Renaissance festival method, uh, you can use it. It's a popular method, especially if you want to do things outdoors because of the, the smell of caramelizing honey or because of, you know, you're, you're worried that it might boil over. You can do it. But again, usually the, the kettle method involves some sort of a, a turkey fryer burner or even a, a live fire with a literal cauldron floating above it. And I just think that that method can be a little harder to control the temperature. A lot of times you can get too hot too fast. Your sugars de decompose into carbon. You're going to get acrid burnt flavors potentially. And most of the sugar will be unfermentable and the pH will be far too low for a healthy fermentation. So I tend to avoid the kettle method. If you found a way to use one of your burners and just set it to a real low temperature, and you're gonna probably wanna stir it fairly often so it doesn't scorch, you, you're more than welcome to do it. I just, I don't see a point to, unless I was gonna uh, caramelize a massive volume of honey at once, I would never choose to do that. Um, there's a pressure, cook pressure cooker method as well. The, the problem with this method is that because you're usually going to put the honey into glass jars and put them in the pressure cooker, first of all, you have to heat the honey up before you put them in the jars, just like you would a brining solution. If you don't do that, your glass is going to crack, just like it would if you're uh, pressure cooking anything or canning anything. But that's the second problem with it is you're not dehydrating it because it is all contained within a, you know, a glass jar. You're not dehydrating, so you're not getting the same flavors. You're going to get some caramelization but you're not going to get some of those intense concentrational flavors. Uh, I included a, a basic Boche. Hey, yeah. Can I ask you something? So uh, have you tried, so it's one of the things I've tried with uh, invert sugar that's, that I've had success with is uh, the oven. Uh, we, so get it, basically get it up to the temperature you want, because you, you talked about using time even though that's not surprisingly not mentioned in the literature much using time to get the caramelization. I mean, with, with invert sugar, that's, that's one of the key things is like hold it at a temperature right. for varying amounts of time to get the darkness. And so what I've done is on the stove, get it up to like 230 or whatever, and then put it in the oven, which is challenging in itself because if, if sit down folks but your oven temperature that like it reads out is nowhere close like right. <laughs> there's like it, it the, the fluctuation it's like that temperature plus or minus 20 degrees or something ridiculous so 
that's that's a challenge in itself, but I have found it to be, uh, it, once you calibrate it and figure out, okay, like w when I put it in the oven on a certain rack, I can maintain this temperature. Once you figure that out, it's actually pretty hands off as far as if you want to put something in there for 30 minutes, an hour, 90 minutes, whatever. So I wonder if that would work for this as well. I think it would work 100%. I have not done it, but I use that method when I make roux. And I do it for the exact same reason. Instead of fighting the battle when I make a roux and I'm making a Cajun or a Creole dish, instead of fight, fighting the battle of not wanting to scorch or burn the roux and constantly stirring it, I tend to just let it do it low and slow in the oven because time is your friend. So I would imagine that a lot of those uh, principles apply, apply with honey. And, and because time seemed to matter so much, I have a feeling that you're probably right. If you hold it, at 240 degrees, there's a good chance it's going to darken and you're going to get some of those richer flavors because as we saw, temperature wasn't really indicative of the flavor. It was really the time spent. So great point. It's a good idea to, to potentially something that I could experiment with because like you said, it, you know, what's the internal temperature? It doesn't really matter, you know, because if you, if you, if I can't just stick with thermometer in it every five minutes to see where it's at, but it's like, we kind of already discussed that that doesn't matter that much anyway. So that, that'd be a good uh, a good experiment to, to play around with. Thanks for bringing that up. And I'm going to share the roux tip with Tina for when she's making chili cheese etouffee because I imagine that will be that will result in a lot less uh, uh, wrist pain the next day from stirring. Yeah, I mean it's intense. I mean my back usually hurts just from standing over the pot for 45 minutes doing it. But uh, I think I think Serious Eats actually did a nice. Uh, a nice study on using the oven method for that so it's it's good that you bring that up i didn't even think about that actually so not really going to discuss this recipe this is more just for anybody that wants to try a basic recipe out and i can give tips on the process if you if you want to reach out to me but i just want to include it also wanted to include some links to some helpful resources that i always use every single mead i make i use the got mead batch calculator it's basically just a way to put in your total volume your total amount of honey, and it'll give you a good idea of what your starting gravity is going to be. So it just gives you a good idea of how much honey you need to acquire and what kind of gravity you can expect. Now, you always want to check it, obviously, with a hydrometer, but I really like that one just to get an idea of um, where I'm going to be. And it also lets you put in alternative uh, fermentables. It lets you put in, oh, I'm going to add five pounds of black currants. And it sort of has a a generic sugar content associated with each fruit. Obviously it depends on season. It depends on fruit source, but again, it gives you a good idea. And it's very helpful, very accurate in my experience too. Uh, Tosna calculator. We already discussed that a little bit, but it's just the way to, um, to calculate how much nutrients you need. So that there's a link to the official calculator for that. All of it's free. Uh, Reddit needs subgroup um, on stabilization. The best resource and best, guide for stabiliz stabilizing your mead that I found is this subgroup and this link. He talks about potassium sorbate, potassium metabisulfite, you know, what to watch out for um, and what it's based off of. Facebook groups, funny enough, again, in the mead world, we've already kind of discussed earlier, not as many people make mead. There's not a lot of research on it. There's not a lot of uh, University of Cal Davis research experiments on mead and the effect of this temperature on this, like there is for hops and all kinds of stuff in the brewing world. So Facebook groups, modern mead makers, I know some of us are already in it that are in this club, but I, I put a link to that page. And if you can't get in through there, it is a private group, but they just ask you, you just have to click join group. Awesome resource. All the best mead makers in the world are in it. All the best amateur mead makers, most of the commercial mead makers, including Krim Shram are in there. All are willing to give all their experience and advice. And that's kind of the fun thing about the, the mead community is it's a lot of it isn't based that much on theory. It's not based on, oh, here's the science behind this. Now it should do this. If I take it to this temperature, this is what should happen. A lot of it is based on experience. A lot of it is based on people trial and error. And, and to me, that seems to be a pretty effective way of figuring out what works versus, you know, some of the experiments I've done with New England IPAs are very, counterintuitive to what the science says should happen. So I, I just think it's interesting because there's a lot more resources and research in the beer world, but those don't always give you the results that they're supposed to. And 
I find the Mead community relying on the anecdotal and experiential evidence being more helpful it tends to produce results that they talk about. Um, the last thing is Ken Schramm's book, The Complete Mead Maker, another great resource that a lot of mead makers uh, uh, use. I actually won this book at, uh, I think it was a, a Bloomington, Bloomington beer competition uh, about seven or eight years ago. I forget what, exactly what it was. It was one at Upland. And I won that book. And that was kind of the very, very start of like what got the wheels turning in my head. Maybe I want to do this someday. Is there any other questions about mead making in general or the boche or caramelizing honey? Uh, outstanding presentation, Dean. Uh, I, I've got the honey. I'm, I'm ready to make boche uh, as soon as I get time inspired by this presentation. I do have one question. Uh, and maybe you, maybe you mentioned this, but I missed it. So when you're when you're using oak to add tannins for balance, in what form do you add the oak? Is it oak chips? Or? I, I use yeah, oak cubes. So it's similar to the surface area issue in, in the beer world. I mean, if you, if you had a, a large oak barrel, you know, you, you can get a sort of slower, steadier maturation if you're gonna use little tiny bits of oak chips, it's gonna to, going to impart its flavor and its characters more quickly. I just tend to use cubes, they're widely available. You can use spirals as well. I also, I, I use medium toast American oak. You can use medium toast French oak. I will say the differences between French oak and American oak aren't that perceptible when you're using it in primary. You can notice some of the differences you're going to get a, a spicier characteristic out of the French oak than you are out of the American oak if you use it in secondary. But yes, I, I just use the oak cubes in primary. And, I, and I'm to the point now where basically every single meat I make has oak cubes in primary. Unless I know that I'm going to make a, 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 a meat that has a lot of tannic fruit like black currants or raspberries or something that has a lot of tannin to it then I'll probably hold off till after fermentation and just to make sure that I don't have too much of a tannin character. But seriously, every meat I make now, I mean, it's, it's a, I, I thought it was silly when I first heard some of the, the guys in the Facebook groups talking about it, but it makes all the difference in the world. The, the structure of your mead is one of the biggest challenges when you're starting off. And again, it's because of the lack of the lack of acidity and tannins. I mean, there's acidity in honey, but there's not enough tannin and it just doesn't transfer. If you're just going to make it traditional, you're going to be discouraged a lot of times when you make your first one. You're like, why does this lack something? It lacks something that I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't taste like a complete beverage. And that's what it lacks. It lacks the structure. So and, and I appreciate. Hey, let me, let me, uh, I'll jump in and uh, uh, extend my current offer uh, that I've got uh, uh, bourbon barrel staves. If anyone wants a half a stave, the cost is two of the finished beers or one of the finished <laughs> bottles of meat. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll take it today. And there's no interest in that period of time between receiving the stave and uh, the. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it sounds like if I take a stave and never use it, then I'm out nothing. So I'll take one. I, I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dean, just to, I'm trying to refresh my memory here, and I feel I, I feel inadequate because I am a certified need judge, and I feel inadequate for two reasons. And what the main reason is until you started talking about Moshe mead, I didn't know what it was. So yeah. like it, it wasn't in the exam study materials. It wasn't on the exam. Um, you know, I, I'm not blaming anybody else but myself for, for that ignorance. But so my question there is, first of all, like, have you entered Boche mead in competition? And what, if so, like, did you find that it seemed like the judges knew what it was and what were the results um and then my second question well i'll i'll i'll, I'll let you answer and then then ask my second question so i i haven't entered a boche in competition i was going to last year um during one of the quarantine competitions that still took place i was going to enter it but i realized it had to go i was going to enter my caramel apple boche sizer so i thought it was pretty good but it needed to go in experimental mead and the 
uh, entry limit had already been reached for experimental mead. And now, Andy, for your second question, uh, why did the, the limit for experimental get reached? Because a lot of people were making bouchets. A lot of people were. And in these mead only competitions, the judges 100% know what bouchets are. And in fact, there's almost an outcry now from people that make other ciders be, and, and other, other meads that don't have a boche characteristic to them because a lot of the best of show meads will end up being like a boche sizer or some form of a boche because it just really, uh, really gives it a, a unique characteristic that you really don't see in, in other meads. Dean, is it is it clearly noticeable that you use this caramelizing technique on it as opposed to just adding a caramel flavor or a maple syrup or, um, you know, something that would just provide some of those toffee caramelized flavors and notes? Can you can you clearly discern that it's a, a distinct caramelized honey flavor, meaning is it unique enough that you go, oh, that's caramelized honey? You, you definitely pick up honey characteristics in the aroma and flavor that would suggest that honey is involved in the project. Now, the, the specific caramel flavors themselves, to say that it was caramelizing honey versus caramelizing another sugar it's hard to really say that chances are you would have pretty good luck making a mead that used honey and then just adding some sort of caramel, just regular caramel sugar to it. Now, what I will say is that I, I don't, most caramel sugars or, or other caramel sources I've had don't give the toastier quality. So the reason that I take a lot of my bouches to the point that it's past the light caramel and even sort of medium toffee stage is because I'm looking for those distinct, unique, toasty, dark toffee, dark toast flavors. And I'm not sure if, if caramel would provide or could provide, I think you can get the toffee probably, but as far as the darker, toastier qualities, uh, there are some mead makers that literally put graham cracker, you know, in secondary, or they'll, they'll even put malts sometimes. Yeah, to or, to or, or uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, treacles and molasses yeah. and, you know, various different types of molasses from your lights to darks. And so I, I'm just, there's other sugars and, and those adjuncts that you could add to recreate some of those flavors. Yeah. Uh, so I was just kind of wondering if the caramelized honey had a truly unique characteristic about it that you kind of knew it was caramelized honey no no i don't i don't Not think caramelized i don't think that caramelized honey has a distinct characteristic i think the only thing distinct about caramelized honey is, is that you can taste that there is honey in it you can definitely still get some of the base characteristics some of the floral fruity notes that most honeys will have you will pick up but again to your point i think you could just make a traditional mead that had honey in it so you know there's honey in there and then you could introduce some caramel flavor from another sugar source and you would probably be able to recreate a lot of, of the, the flavors you get you're, you're not, right not, not near as authentic or as much fun though true and the, and the toasty part is the part that i'm not so sure about eh, how would you get that part but yeah i don't know maybe you could toast the other sugar just like you would toast the honey so so uh dean excellent presentation fantastic uh content and very well stated um I'm, I've never been a huge mead lover, but I am uh, a pretty big fan of braggots. Yeah. And the whole time you're talking about caramelizing honey, I'm thinking, holy crap, how about a caramelized honey braggot? Yes. I, I wanted to ask if anybody who didn't want to make, who wasn't inspired to make a mead from this, but wanted to brew beer, I wanted to ask if anybody wanted to do a uh, collaboration with the boche that I'm making. Uh, yeah. there, I, I think it'd be really cool to be able to make a brag, maybe even a, a stout or a porter or something that, you know, where some of those flavors would really integrate well, obviously not an IPA or something like that. But, um, and, it, and I know Ron, you mentioned that you're not a big mead fan. And one of, one of the reasons that I think my apple uh, sizer boche was one of the best meads I've ever made is because you've had about five of my meads and most of the time, you know, you're just like, eh, it is whatever, or eh, it's a little hot, or it's not, not too 
Not too much I, of what you I like. I like them. I just, they're well, just you, but you like that one. You like yeah. the, you had it at the Kentucky Derby at your house a couple years ago outside and you actually liked it. And I think I a lot of that. the notes in the Boche were similar to characteristics you can get in bourbon. Some of the caramel yeah. notes. And I think that that was just a, yeah. a nice, you know, nice little way to do that. And I, I would also say that, look, if you've never made a mead, a Boche is kind of an interesting way to start because again, just go buy cheap store brand honey. That way, it's not as expensive if you mess up, you know, and you can end up with a wonderful, wonderful uh, beverage at the end. Excellent. Other Andy, questions? I think, and, yeah, Andy, I think you had a secondary question. I... Oh, that's right. Oh, I, I was just going to ask for a, a brief review of mead, of, of balance in mead. So I think when I learned this, it was a five, there's like a five pointed star you're trying to balance on which is like honey sweetness tannins acids alcohol and i always forget one <laughs> so yeah i don't so, know about the fifth one so is that um so with boche it like does that how does that skew the balance it does it i mean are, are we talking about leaning more heavily on the tannins and acids when you're doing boche because you're getting caramelization that can appear on the palate as kind of leaning sweet do you think do you think you need to be heavier on the tannins and acids alcohol was one i left out i think um to 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 balance the perceived sweetness that you get from the caramelization of sugars I think that the tannin is still very important because that's a structural component. I mean, devoid of the flavor of some of the tannins and, and oak, but the structural aspect that it provides to your to your mead, the tannin is important in Boche, not any more or less than other meads. Now, as far as would the acids be more important because you've got this perceived sweetness that you might not have in other meads, in, 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 in my experiences, this is where balance gets interesting. I don't think acidic flavors go very well with some of the darker, toastier flavors. Yeah, it's meads. like it's like burnt coffee pot flavor. Right. Like, like the roast and acid, yeah. Yeah, so, so if you're on the lighter end of the spectrum where it is that caramely sort of Boche character, which, which I talked about, that's the character that you get that sort of gives the impression of sweetness. The darker Boche gives the impression of a savory really. And it's funny because you can actually use the savory as part of the balancing the flavors and the savory actually will balance sweetness and honey. And so a lot of times you'll need to back sweeten your more savory, darker boches more than you would even a traditional meat because you've got that, that darker note that, that's, it's very intense. It's, it's you, you almost get some tea like characters, like a stewed tea and some, some notes and dark notes that are like that. And it's, yeah, I, I, I don't love the idea of, um, you know, a ton of acid flavor. So I, I would stick with the structural aspect on Boches as far as some tannins and then sweetness needed if it's a darker Boche. But yeah, you definitely, you don't need to add more acid than you would any other mead. And I will say one aspect that gets a little confusing about acid and, and balanced meads is a lot of times when you're, when you're tasting these in competitions, you get a sweet tart flavor. And it's because I think that these mead makers are focusing so heavily on really trying to balance out that sweetness with acid. And this use of acid in meads to balance is very similar to acid in cooking. You don't always want lemon juice to come through in the final product when you're using lemons. Sometimes yeah. you're using lemon juice to bring out the other flavors. Sometimes you're just using it as an underlying balance to balance out the other spices, not something you want to actually come through in the final flavor. And too many homebrew meads I taste are either completely flabby and lacking acid or have too much acid because because they're they still don't have the experience to know when enough acid is enough. And you just want a very light tart flavor, but it's more about it's more about it balancing the sweetness than it is bringing out acid flavor. I, I wonder too about the effects of oxidation because I would think that with Boche, oxidation might be more beneficial 
uh, than in an unadulterated uh, honey mead. Okay, so one thing I, I would agree with you, and I, I wouldn't agree because of just the bow shape process. I would agree with you because of the intensity of flavors. Okay, any mead that has a ton of flavors going on with it, including very dark, berry heavy, berry melomels that are heavily sweetened, heavily berry and he heavily acidified. There are people, modern meat makers, that will actually micro-oxidize these meats intentionally to try to soften some of the edges, to almost replicate some of the softening that you would get when you're making a red wine. And the, the oxidation of some of those more intense flavors in a boche, it's definitely going to benefit it because they, they tend to be a little more aggressive and rough around the edges at a younger age when you compare them to just your traditional meat. The, the flavors are just more intense. And in my opinion, in my experience with mead making, the more intense the flavors, no matter what it is, whether it's intensely fruity and acidic or it's intensely dark, toffee, boche, those flavors can stand oxidation more. And it makes sense in the beer world with barley wines, with big stouts, those can age better. Those tend to react better to some oxidation than lighter colored beers or hot beer beers and they don't react as well. Other questions for Dean? That uh, makes sense, Dean. It's great points. Yeah. Nice. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. I was pretty nervous for this. I haven't done a presentation in like 14 years, so. I did a fantastic oh, job. Oh, you did awesome, man. The only right, thing that would have been better is like the smell of vision you know, <laughs> in me. Yeah. Through, uh, screen. <laughs> And, and on, there was a few slides where I, I wish I could have the color wheel at the same time as the chart, but it just didn't really fit on the page so that you could really see anything. But they had to keep switching back and forth. But yeah, I, I wish you guys could have smelled it the other day. I, I had no intention of actually finishing the, the mead process. I was going to just caramelize some honey, but I was like, shit, I'm 35 bucks in, man. I'm, I'm going to make a mead out of this. And it was easy. It took like two hours. Nice. Uh, hey, if you want to... Dean, I, if you I, want to do a collab, I'm I'm definitely game with you. Awesome. Give me maybe two months. Give me maybe two months and we'll finish up the fermentation on this. I would love to collab on it. And and I, I have a feeling because you know, this mead, show it on the slide here, is super dark in primary fermentation. And I think the good part about that is it could withstand being blended with something, in, in this case beer, and it'll still retain some of its qualities. So Obviously, that, that thing is dark. I mean, that is, that looks yeah. like dark chocolate. So, would love uh, to. Cool. I, I think we need a, this needs to be a two-part presentation with a tasting in a couple of months. Yeah, I, I know. I, I wish this could have been live because I wanted to share the caramel apple boche with you guys so you could really get an idea of how the final product, how, how those flavor notes shine through in the end. Oh, yeah. No, we, we won't let you forget. Don't worry. Yeah, we'll, we'll be able to get together in a couple of months, man. And that'll be that'd be a, a, a great uh, finish to this presentation. And and uh, I, I, I may have mentioned it to a couple of you and to you, Dean. I've got um, a couple bottles, little bottles of Kurt Schilling's mead. He used to be quite the mead maker back in the day and I bought all that stuff off of him when he sold his homebrew shop up in Anderson and I had these boxes of just all kinds of stuff and I finally got to go through some of them and, and I found a couple of things labeled mead <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're, they're quite strong um, very high ABV and they're probably 25 years old so uh We'll taste a little bit of uh, Indiana's mead making history. That'd be cool. When we, when we get together and do that, sharing that would be wonderful. Sounds like we got a theme for our meeting. Absolutely. A meeting. <laughs> a meeting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, outstanding, Dean. Fabulous addition to our YouTube channel as well. And uh, I have learned a ton. So thank you so much. Next up, and we haven't like figured out the date exactly yet, but uh, Todd Cogswell uh, will be doing a presentation on Quike yeast and Quike uh, brewing. 
So he has done a lot of that and gone way out to the edges of what you can, what styles of beer you can possibly brew with Quike, um, many of which I have tasted. Uh, so I have evidence, uh, and I, I think this will be pretty exciting. Look for it at the toward the end of June, I think. Uh, still trying to nail that down. But um, I think we're off to a good start with two just wonderfully technical presentations uh, for the CIA, and I applaud um, Dean and John Allison on those. Uh, look for at least uh, two or three more this year. My goal is to have four. If modest goals are achievable, right? Uh, that's what I'm going for. But if we can do more than that, then so much the better. Uh, if you have a presentation you'd like to give, and I remind everybody, you don't have to be an expert to give a presentation. Giving the presentation is how you become an expert. So just remember that. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, people who've done it have uh, had a rewarding experience. So and and so have all of us. So thank you um, and uh, enjoy. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Peace. Hey, cheers, guys.